Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. I bring greetings and salutations from the eighth wonder of the world, Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Amen, somebody. I see that my colleague, Johnny Perez, wore the Arizona State University, so he's repping you guys. So it was only good for me to rep East New York, Brooklyn. Let me begin with a verse from the Bible. I am a pastor, so I'm not going to try to preach to you this morning, but I want to start with a very simple verse. And it's coming from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 35 through 40. And there was a discussion, an argument between the Pharisees, those who were in power at that time, and some of Jesus' followers, his disciples. The first conversation where they questioned what was salvation. And Jesus responded, when I was in prison, you came to visit me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was sick, you didn't heal me. But Rabbi, that was the title they gave him as a mockery, if you will. Rabbi, where were you in prison? Where were you hungry? When were you sick? When were you naked? And Jesus gave them a simple response to what you have done to the least of these you have done unto me. His disciples, after walking with three and a half years with their king, seeing the miracles, giving sight to the blind, healing the lame, feeding the poor, admonishing those who were oppressing the people of the community. He gave them the same question. What do you mean, Lord? When were you in prison? When were you naked? When were you sick? When were you hungry? And he repeated again. To what you have done to the least of these, you have done unto me. If Jesus was on earth today, we would find him visiting the prisons and eating with them and having a simple conversation. We have a problem in this great country of ours. People are investing in many of our failures, and I thank God for the many volunteers that are present here who have decided to not only rise above their confusion, but have enough fortitude to invest in our success. The reason why is because we have been labeled criminals, outcasts, loners, misfits, lepers of society, but in his eyes, no one is beyond redemption. I was a young boy when I went into prison. Just like Sister Colby told us and my colleague, my name is Reverend Dr. Hector Bienvenido Custodio. We have a problem as Latinos, we give these children's long names, so everyone calls me Benny for short. <laughs> But I was not always Reverend Dr. Hector Bienvenido Custodio, or as I am known as Pastor Benny. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of my story. At the mere age of 16 years old in 1986, I, along with nine other individuals, created one of the most feared gangs in New York City, the Latin Kings. Not only was I their original founding member, but I was their second in command. I controlled them inside and outside of prison. December 16, 1991, I was no longer Hector Bienvenido Custodio. I was 441 386 Sentenced to 125 years to life for murder in the second degree. Can you imagine 125 years to life? I went to prison a functioning illiterate. I had a less than a sixth grade reading level. I didn't have enough money to, or luxury to obtain a lawyer to fight my wrongful conviction. So I had two choices. Either I become bitter and angry and die in prison, or educate myself and speak to an unmerciful giant that is killing and destroying our communities today. From 441 91 13 386, I spent almost five years on Rikers Island fighting my case. And out of all those years I spent, 
I had 1,580 days in solitary confinement. I went to three trials. Mistrial, hung jury, third trial, I began Monday. I was found guilty on Wednesday afternoon of murder in the second degree. January 6, 1995, I was sentenced and I officially became a consumer of the Department of Corrections. I was no longer 441-91-13-386. I became 95A0460. There is some place where they call downstate correctional facility where they line us up 250 to 300 men. We are holds down, we are throwing some white powder on ourselves just in case we have lice, and our facial hairs and our hair is shaved. And there was a 17-year-old boy next to me who was shaking. In fact, when we were given our razors to shave our facial hair, the young boy was so nervous, didn't understand why he had to endure this atrocity committed against him. And he was sentenced to 25 years to life. His hand was shaking so much, he cut himself. And he kept mumbling, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why I'm here. We were herded to these cages after we were stripped of our dignity, of our humanity, and given the name inmate. The Bible says there's power of life and death in the tongue. You speak life to an individual, they will live. If you speak death, that's what they'll become, a walking zombie. So for as long as I can remember, 95A0460 was my name. When we were sent to the cells, the young boy couldn't take it anymore. He took a sheet, threw it over the light, and took his life. We began banging on the doors so that the correction officers would at least hear what was going on. But unfortunately, a game of spades was much more worth than a human life. An hour later, the cells were open. And the ironic part of this unfortunate situation is that the cell where I was in was cracked open. And I was the one who was supposed to take this kid down. As I held the young boy in my arms, white young kid, they were calling him white trash and laughing. I didn't believe in God back then. My God was a gun, a knife, and money. And I was so angry that night that I screamed at God and I said, if you exist, then help me and give me the wisdom, the knowledge, the power to speak against this unmerciful giant that is actually destroying our people. Empower me, enhance my life so that I can speak truth to power. Little did I know that something was working behind the scenes. And I was taken to a prison Attica Correctional Facility was my first prison. And here I am, addicted to heroin, a young so-called gangster, and a functioning illiterate. How the hell am I going to get out of this predicament? And I remember I was sitting on the bleachers one time. I'm a diehard Yankees fan. No disrespect to the Arizona Diamondbacks. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the bleachers. And a group of young men and women were touring the facility. They were about to implement a program that will assist men who just graduated from their GD to pursue higher education. And one of the young men pointed at me and said, young, boy, young man, can we have a second of your time? I'm involved in the Yankee. I'm, I'm excited. I just want to see my Yankee game. I don't want to be bothered. I got to do the rest of my life in prison. Just leave me alone. But they continued. Being, in, being consistent of recruiting men to afford them an opportunity to be involved in an education arena. They introduced themselves and they said, we are from NYTS. And I said, what's that, a gang? And they said, no, we are from the New York Theological Seminary. We have a program that we offer the men in prison, 36 credits, and we give them a certificate in ministry and human services. Are you interested? I said, no. I want to see my Yankee game. Leave me alone. But there was one young lady. She was 
I'm 60 years old, 60, 65, give or take. I was walking with a cane. There was something in that woman's eyes that captivated me. And she said, young man, I want you to look at me. And I want you to understand that you have power, but you're using it in the wrong way. If you allow us an opportunity to help you, to educate you, we're going to transfer that negative power into a positive power in which you're going to minister to countless lives. But something about that little woman's voice woke up the dormant potential that was inside of me. And as they went and took me into this academic arena and introduced to me Frederick Douglass, who was one of the greatest American orators of history. Dr. King, Dr. Malcolm X, Harriet Tubman, Nelson Mandela, Gandhi. When these historical and biblical figures were coming alive inside a classroom setting, I was free for the very first time. These men and women who volunteered their time to invest in our success while other people invested in our failures, spent countless of hours under inclement weather just to come and spend an hour and a half or two hours educating us. I finally obtained my certificate in ministry and human services and had to do something about my legal condition. And they offered a program that gave us an associate's degree and I became a certified paralegal and started litigating my case. I wrote over 60,000 letters. While in prison, the only person who was there by my side was my mom and my little sister. My ex-wife left me for my best friends, for my best friend, friends and family disappeared. I wrote 60,000 letters to congressmen, assemblymen, universities, anyone who would hear my story because I knew that one day I had to be free. And I started litigating my case and I'm one of the very few prisoners in the state of New York that has fought this system and took it to the highest court of the country, United States Supreme Court, and beat them at their own game. My sentence was reduced from 125 years to life to 33 and a third to life. So I'm from Brooklyn. Now, if you're going to hit me, make sure you're going to knock me down so I don't get back up. Because I'm in the fight, and you got to kill me, man. And I started fighting with them, and I started submitting motions and letters and, 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 and litigating my case to the point where I believed that they got so tired of me, they had to vomit me out the prison system. From 33 and a third to life, they reduced my sentence to 22 years to life. From 22 years to life to 15. And I went and continued and earned my Bachelor's of Arts degree while inside that human warehouse. And ultimately earned my master's, in which now it was my turn to go out inside the, outside to the yards and recruit men and teach them English Writing 101. Chris. Teach them about liberation theology from a social revolution perspective. And one year in 2008, one of the individuals who falsely accused me not only ended up being in the same prison where I was at, but right across the cell from me. The gangster part side of me could have killed them, would have done it with a smile on my face, and I would have never regretted it, and I would have gotten away. But the preacher side of me needed to know what was the purpose of me enduring 20 years of my life inside this concrete jungle. September 27th, 2011, I walked out of prison with three pairs of pants and two t-shirts and a bag full of books because I became an avid reader in prison. I came home to a world that I knew nothing of. I was a dinosaur. These little gadgets that we have here, when I was home, they had the big motor rollers with the plastic antennas. The video games of that time was Atari and Genesis, uh, and, and Atari, Nintendo, and Sega Genesis was coming out. And the music was much different. I'm old school, old hip hop and R&B, man. <laughs> Marvin Gaye, Harold Melvin, and the Blue Notes. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. And I'm an old school romantic. 
And I came home to a world that was too fast and not understanding that I am still a human being. But yet I continued pushing forward and I obtained an opportunity to earn my license as a substance abuse counselor where I deal with people with mental health and substance abuse issues. I earned my clinical pastoral education CPE units and became a certified board chaplain and started entering Rikers Island and going back into the prisons and helping the men and women reintegrate back into society. And I got a call where I was afforded the opportunity of a full scholarship to earn my doctorate degree. December 4th that just passed, I stood before a panel for two and a half grueling hours and defended my dissertation. And today I have the best job in the world. I am a pastor. And I pastor three congregations and a church in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm not your average pastor. I'm the pastor who will awaken that dormant potential inside of you. Too much is given, much is required. Why am I sharing that story with you all? Because I was informed yesterday over a lovely dinner, and I thank our lovely guests for taking us to this beautiful restaurant in which I was informed how important, how vital of a role of those of you who volunteer inside these human warehouses. If anything else that you receive from this conference today, my colleague and my brother and good friend Johnny and myself are products of your labor. We are the fruit of your labor for those of you who volunteer and give of yourself and not count it robbery to go inside these prison walls and educate a man and a woman. And here's why. What would you rather have? Because sooner or later, these men and these women that are considered less than human beings are reduced to numerical digits are going to come home one day whether you recognize that or not. And the question is, what would we rather have in our community? Will we rather have a person who will commit a more heinous crime? Or would you have an educated individual who will invest in their community and give back because they have been given another chance and become an asset to our community as opposed to a liability? What would you rather have? I commend those of you who are volunteering your time. Because today, Johnny and myself have the pleasure of talking and inspiring, enhancing, and challenging countless of lives that is not over. And thank you from the bottom of our hearts for investing in us and our success while other people invested in our failures. I want to thank you and commend you. And today, you are inducted into my Hall of Fame. I don't know you personally by name, but you are inducted into my Hall of Fame because you are my heroes. For those of you who come through and don't think it robbery to, not, to educate a human being. Continue the work. I implore you to please consider helping us or assisting us with this endeavor of changing the cultural mindset of this country. Because none of you are exempt from being incarcerated. You can be walking from here to the Starbucks and you can be arrested. There was a time where I was happily married to my best friend, my childhood sweetheart. I was at the peak of my life. My daughter was a year old and she was pregnant with my second son when that privilege was robbed away from me. But I didn't give up hope. And today, I am happy because I get to do what was not done for me. Thank you. <laughs>